I am an English professor, and uh, that means that almost all of my scientific knowledge, sorry, I'm an English professor who is married to a biology professor. So almost everything I know about science I acquired by marriage, <laughs> such as this. So this is my opening image. This is uh, uh, what the evolutionary biologists would refer to as punctuated equilibrium, which is the notion, of course, for those of you who aren't English professors, I'll explain it to you, um, that evolution does not happen in a straight and steady line, but instead it happens in these jumps of these great jumps of uh, changes in speciation. Stephen Jay Gould famously analogized this to watching a baseball game in which you go through long periods of time in which nothing happens, and then all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of action. I think we are in higher education at a moment of punctuated equilibrium that we're at a moment when the speciation of what higher education looks like is changing rapidly. And that the, what will happen over the next 5, 10, 15 years that started maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago is, is, is one of these changes in higher education. And of course, evolution is not progress. So the question is, how do we thrive, not just survive in this shift? I was using this analogy to talk a few months ago at Ohio State, and a biology professor came up to me afterward and helpfully added that even though I got punctuated equilibrium right, I had left out the part that in a moment of punctuated equilibrium, like 99% of all life forms die. <laughs> I thought, Thank you for that uplifting addition. So I want to, in my relatively brief remarks, I want to talk about that quadrant and that this is where we need to be designing for. So in any two by two, you always want to be in the upper right quadrant. <laughs> so this is the quadrant that to me is defined by inclusivity and integration. So let me take a few minutes to get there. I want to first start by talking about that axis, the axis of disintegrative integrative. I believe that that is the most important tension of our time in higher education right now, is the tension between whether you fundamentally believe in a dis what I have totally non-judgmentally labeled a disintegrative in education or an integrative education, vision of learning. Here's what I mean by that. I'm going to parse this list. On the left is what I think of as the disintegrative side. It's designing for modular or granular learning. It's elementary competency-based learning, learning decoupled from formal boundaries, learning anytime, anywhere, analytics-driven. I want to be super clear. I don't think of the left side of this list as evil and the right side as good. I'm only saying that if we're only designing for those elements on the left, then you're probably working with a diminished version of education and a diminished vision of learning. So that left side, it comes from what I think of as sort of the five horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, the pressures on higher ed, reduction in public funding, the expansion of who it is that needs access to higher education, the pressures on accountability, the rise of analytics, the digital revolution. Right? I, this is not a crowd I need to elaborate, uh, you know, what's happened the last 15, 20, 25 years, but much of the money has been initially driven toward thinking about how we scale and automate education and reduce instructional costs. Whenever I see this slide, I always think I want to write a book called Everything's Fine. <laughs> <laughs> We're all familiar with this discourse, right? And part of the discourse is actually that unbundling, the idea that we can unbundle higher education, serves equity. That actually the way to serve the 11 million 
people in the United States who don't have access to higher education is to unbundle higher education. We actually know in a lot, for a lot of reasons that's not really the case, though there are a lot of important solutions out there. So that's a very quick version of some of the forces driving what's on the left. And again, I think our future depends on us deploying the things on the left. I'm just saying if that's all we're focused on, we're in trouble. So on the right is an integrative vision of learning, okay? that it's not a just about discrete learning experiences, that education is more than the sum of the parts, that it's about curriculum, co-curriculum, it's about knowledge, skills, dispositions, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. It's about teaching students to make connections and integrate, and it's designing for what teaching at a Jesuit institution we would call the whole person. So this is what, one of the ways to think about what it means to educate for the whole person. You're not just teaching knowledge, you're not just teaching skills, you're teaching also to something broader that we might call dispositions. This is something probably super familiar to all of you. That's a list of things I would think of as dispositions. Learning to learn, creativity, curiosity, humility, ethical judgment. I like to call these hard skills. Right? And this is in contrast to the so-called soft skills, like chemistry and statistics. <laughs> and econometrics, you know, stuff you can learn in courses. So we know you can't directly teach these kinds of dispositions, but you can design environments in which we're more likely to be cultivated. And those environments are usually unscripted, guided inquiry, high-impact environments, like the several examples in the last session, including looking for novel cures for cancer. Why should we care so much about integrative learning and these kinds of dispositions? Well, the AI session set this up perfectly because we know that the skills that will be left to humans are all about non-routine tasks, working with complex information, working with novel situations. We also know from the Gallup-Purdue poll, right? They've done this twice, 30,000 alumni from a whole diverse range of schools asking them 20 years later if they're thriving in their work or engaged in their work or flourishing in their life. And the punchline is that if you are 74% more likely to be thriving at work or flourishing if you had one of those two things in college, an adult mentor who cared about you and worked on a sustained project for a semester or longer. Here's that data a little bit closer. 64% said they had a professor who made me excited about learning, 27% a professor who cared about me as a person, 22% a mentor who encouraged my hopes and dreams, 14% had all three. 32% did a long-term project, 30% an internship, 20% co-curricular, 6% did all three, only 6%. So long before the digital age, higher education was doing a pretty good job at disintegrative education. So rather than unbundling, I like to think about this as rebundling. That what it lay ahead of us and what has been much of the conversation that I caught this afternoon is learning how to put what's on the left in the service of what's on the right. These two discourses have hardly talked to each other. People who drive what's on the left don't think a lot about integrative learning. The people who traffic on the right have not been current with what I would call the new digital ecosystem. I think the most important thing we can do to think about the future of learning is to put what's on the left in the service of the right. And there's a million things we could talk about in that regard, and I'll talk about just a couple. But first, let me finish my construct. So that's the disintegrative integrative axis. The other axis is inclusive, what, I, what many people call inclusive excellence, probably a very familiar term to you, coined by the American Association of Colleges and Universities, picked up by people like the Hughes Foundation, etc. It's about inclusion, it's about diversity, it's about equity, 
It's about saying that everyone not only has access to, should have access to higher education, but has, should have access to a de defined a version of education that's uh, shaped by excellence. So what is on the other side, what's on the other end of the axis from inclusive excellence? Exclusive excellence. Right? That's, that's the tradition of, we never use this term, right? Exclusive excellence is what higher education was in the United States for a couple of hundred years. It was for a very few people and for a very particular purpose. It takes in highly qualified and prepared students and brings them into rich and holistic environments. If you Google inclusive excellence, you'll get 300,000 hits to like the American Association of Colleges and University. If you Google exclusive excellence, you will find luxury resorts in Mexico. Right? <laughs> that is not a term that we use because it's so naturalized to the history of higher education. So I think you can plot the current landscape of higher education around this. I think you could put many startups and disruptors, many of which are doing very interesting experiments, Mission U, et cetera, in, often in the inclusive realm but in what I would think of as disintegrative, highly skills-focused, targeted, workforce-focused. You could put something like Minerva University, claims to be the first elite university founded in the United States in 100 years, one of the most incredibly integrated curricula you've ever seen, way down on the bottom right. I would put many sort of selective college, liberal arts colleges and universities somewhere down there. I would put a lot of public institutions on that side of the line toward the disintegrative side. But I think there's a lot of forces pulling everybody up into the right-hand quadrant. Elite universities are getting a lot of pressure to increase their first-gen low-income students. They're being pulled up into the inclusive quad end. A lot of our efforts in large publics, University Innovation Alliance, et cetera, et cetera, are trying to introduce high-impact practices, various kinds of interventions into uh, flipped classrooms, et cetera, that I think are pulling them more into the integrative space. So there's lots of things trying to pull us up into the upper right, even though there's lots of forces pulling us down, especially pulling publics down to the disintegrative side. But this is the challenge to my mind. When you look at a number like 6% of all graduates, that's why I put so many schools over down on the disintegrative side. So what does it mean to design for the upper right quadrant? I don't think the upper right is where higher education as a sector has ever been. There have been movements that have moved us more toward the inclusive, and there's always been resource-rich schools that have been highly integrative. Digital revolution, AI, advances in what we know about the science of learning, what we're learning about income inequality, all those things, I think, put us in a position to be thinking about that upper right quadrant. But that's not a place that we've ever designed for. So what does it mean to design for that quadrant? I'm going to give you, like, three really three principles. There are many more. So first, connect what has typically not been connected. What does that mean? Well, for example, University of Minnesota at Rochester, 10-year-old branch campus, the University of Minnesota, to my mind, one of the most amazing institutions in all of higher education. 50% Pell eligible students, 38% students of color. Every student engages in high-impact practices. They have no departments. All faculty hold office hours in one common space called the Just Ask Center. And as their chancellor said to me, well, of course, why wouldn't we hold our office hours in one space? There is no such thing as a major assignment that is not shared by at least two courses. I'm like, of course. <laughs> Or to take an example of somewhere that didn't have the luxury to build itself up from the ground up, Georgia State, well-known case example, 
increase their graduation rates significantly over the last 13, 15 years, increase their Pell eligibles significantly at the same time. How'd they do it? Huge data warehouse that distributed data on at-risk students to people all over the campus. But that's just part of what they did. They created learning communities, peer tutoring, a summer success academy, and they structurally connected admissions, advising, registrar, financial aid, and institutional research. And really, that's the so-called elegant detail that makes all the other stuff work. Here's a quote from a case study that Martin Kurzweil and Derek Wu did. Indeed, no single initiative is responsible for the dramatic gains at Georgia State. The university's improvement represents the accumulated impact of a dozen or more relatively modest programs. As it turns out, the recipe for Georgia State's success is not a particular solution, but rather a particular approach to problem solving. So one principle, connect what's been disconnected. I don't think we can design for that upper right quadrant in a disconnected environment. But I would say that the most important thing is to design environments that privilege integrative learning. So integrative learning can mean a lot of things. It can mean interdisciplinary. It can mean theory to practice. I'm using integrative in this sense. This is Sarah's foot. Sarah, at the time that this picture was taken, was a first-year student at Georgetown. She had just, uh, she came to Georgetown with a love of biology. She actually came to Georgetown with a love of neurobiology. In the final exam of her first-year biology course, the entire exam was built around the chemical agent, serotonin. This, for Sarah, that the exam was on serotonin, became the final sign from God that she should go out and get a tattoo of the chemical compound of serotonin on her foot. And as I like to joke, thus expressing, as so many tattoos have before it, that this was no mere crush, but true love. In some literal and symbolic way, this is what one of my students called in a class I was teaching, the imprint of integration. Someone who lives an identity as a learner and a discoverer. So that's what I mean by integration. Not everybody has to get a tattoo. And I was presenting this to 200 biology professors in July, and um, I could just tell the whole audience was like, oh, the biology professor in me is really proud, and the parent in me is like, what? <laughs> <laughs> So I want to finish by telling you a story about the imprint of integration. And unfortunately, this is the part that's about wine. So this is a quick story about the Regent Science Scholars Program that we started at Georgetown three years ago for the purpose of supporting first-generation low-income students to succeed in STEM. It has two key parts, a summer bridge program, as many people have, and then between each, over each summer for the remainder, an online community where students not only communicate with each other while they're home with their families, but take a series of skills modules to strengthen knowledge for their upcoming courses in the next year. In three years, we've quintupled the number of first-gen low-income students who are majoring in biomedical majors, and now more than 20% of the matriculating class of biology majors are first-gen low-income students. That was 2% over three years ago. Right? This, is the most, this is the most difficult way to get into Georgetown, is as a biology major. So I want to tell you a story about, that took place in this five-week summer bridge program. And it has to do with my wife and my favorite winery in the state of Virginia called Glen Manor. That this story takes place at our favorite winery is not a coincidence. So we got an, an invitation as case club members to come to a barrel tasting. He said he'd been experimenting with feral yeast, what he calls feral yeast, letting the yeasts of the winery, instead of using commercial yeast, flavor the wine. And he said he's been experimenting for years, and he wants his case club members to come out and taste these wines and do an experiment. And he had the whole barrel tasting set up as a very scientific thing with things, you know, pads and pencils, etc., I was, of course, just enjoying what was going on. My wife 
who's the biology professor, was thinking, I could create a whole curriculum around this. So at the end of it, she said to him, so has anybody mapped your microbiome? Which seems like a fairly personal question to ask somebody. (laughs) He said, why, do you have a research team that does that? And she goes, oh, I have a research team. I have 29 students arriving next week. That's the vineyard from the sky. On his website, he's got maps of which kinds of soils. This is the professor. Two points. If I had time, I'd play you a video clip, but because I don't have time, I will, on a, as a rare occasion, speak for her. Two points she would make. One is that she's teaching all the things she would teach in a, in a summer bridge biochemistry course, but she's tying them to the wine project. So it's not that she's sacrificing content, she's just integrating it. And the second thing she would say is that it became, within a day, all about Jeff. Jeff White is the name of the winemaker. She said, you're a research team. Jeff needs you to do this. And within a day, the students were saying, would this help Jeff? How do we plate stuff in Petri dishes? Well, what would, what would help Jeff? How do we want to display the data? What would help Jeff? Here's an email as they were puzzling over the experiment design, which was entirely theirs to work through. It took them a week. This is from one of the students, Nohad. I've been thinking about the design of the lab all night. I think I have an understanding now after reading the material over again. My suggestion is to create an experiment with, 20, with like 20 control groups. That's like the greatest phrase ever, isn't it? Like 20 control groups. Then hypothetically speaking, I'll create multiple juices using different combinations of the microbes. This will help me keep track of them, allow me to distinguish one group from another. Does this seem possible? Can this lead me to understanding its flavor profile, giving Jeff the best possible taste? These are, of course, 18-year-olds. It was quite amusing. (laughs) They were reading some technical articles about the procedures, and... (laughs) The professor said, write any terms on the board that you don't understand. And the first one up was Merlot. (laughs) And and, and a vicious argument about how to pronounce terroir. But this is their design, right? They figured out they needed 16 samples. They calculated the slopes. They decided to do the surface and the foot down. They picked it all out. They did the design. We went out. We collected soil samples. She brought them back. They spent four weeks working with them. These are some of their procedures, which I hope need no explanation (laughs) because I don't know how to explain them. (laughs) Then we took them out there. And to be clear, as we said to our risk office, to the vineyard, not the winery, That picture is students walking up and down aisles, taking selfies of themselves and the dirt. They're up there saying, oh my God, it's row 12. That's my dirt. I mean, literally taking selfies with their soil spots. That's the imprint of integration. And then on the crush pad of the winery, seven teams presented their results. Each team one after another their whole process, their method, their findings. So I'll just end with a couple more design principles. Start with respect. That's what it means to design for that quadrant, the respect of what it is that students can do and what it is we want students to be. That's a picture of Jeff on the crush pad talking to the class, saying to the class, so what's next? So now 16 of the 29 as freshmen are continuing on the project as undergraduate researchers. And the last principle, design for the greater purposes of higher education. So what is the digital revolution for? What is then AI for? What does it mean to put the left in the service of the right? It's a picture I took at Northeastern University. What if what it meant to design for the fourth quadrant was to say the most important outcome was what it meant to develop agents of positive change? I've been thinking a lot 
recently about how much the word integrity, about how the word integrity comes from the same root as integration. It means whole, from the Latin integer. It means your parts are symmetrical with the whole, but it also means that your actions are consistent with your values. So I hope that the future of learning is not just about integration, it's about integrity. And I think that's what integrity looks like. That's what equity looks like. It looks like te from a really lousy resourced high school in Hampton Roads, Virginia, in her fifth week of a summer bridge course, who hasn't even formally begun her college education, explaining her scientific process to one of the best winemakers in Virginia. Thank you.